you've all met me before. I don't give, need to give too much uh, introduction. Uh, I do want to emphasize that uh, everything I'm talking about is really the collective work of a large uh, group of people. Well, small group of people, actually. This is all, uh, this is everyone. We're not as big as Mercator Ocean, but I think we do quite well. Um, so quickly to recap uh, what I described uh, in my lecture on Tuesday, it was nearly a week ago. You've probably forgotten half of it. So this is our, uh, my area uh, where I'm working. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, New York, Cape Cod, Canada. Um, uh, as uh, Jean-Michel described, we had also created our homemade MDT, and I described a little bit about this. So we have the Gulf Stream out here. We have constrained our MDT to match CLS 13 so that we can have this seamless transition through to the global scale. But we needed to recover um, some detail in the coastal circulation that is missing from these large-scale um, uh, basin scale and global uh, Godet class models like uh, Mercator Ocean and HICOM. And uh, the key points are that there is uh, recirculation around the Georges Bank that's actually driven by uh, tidal residual forces and a very strong coastal current that's coherent from the Scotian Shelf through the Gulf of Maine all the way down through the Mid-Atlantic Bight to Cape Hatteras, where it separates and joins the, the Gulf Stream. So that's the general circulation <coughs> sort of history. I went through uh, how we had configured this coastal model using uh, open boundary conditions from uh, Mercator Ocean, a really um, outstanding product. We make some adjustments for biases in temperature and salinity, particularly at the coastal inflows on the Scotian Shelf, where the salinity is, uh, is too high in these global models. We make our own uh, mean dynamic topography, our homemade mean dynamic topography. Um, we have tides, so we add harmonic tides to those global products. They don't have tides in them. Um, and we use a combination of, of boundary conditions to specify those inflows. We ran that model, oh, oh and I said it's a very, it's a relatively data-rich area. We've got two regional associations of US Ayus, Niracus and Maracus, and right in the middle of the domain here, we had this very uh, intensive observing experiment from the National Science Foundation uh, Ocean Observatories Initiative, the Pioneer Array, which is uh, one, two, three, uh, seven uh, surface to uh, seafloor moorings that have profiling CTDs, moored uh, acoustic Doppler current profilers, there are uh, autonomous glider operations, uh, AUV Remus operations, a couple of uh, prototype moorings that have docking stations for those Remus. I don't think they're quite working yet, but it's really a spectacular um, idea. Okay, lots of data. All right. Uh, I described all the, the lengths we go to to acquire all the observations we can, things that are available in real, in real time, uh, delayed mode observations from turtles and lobsters and the fishing fleet. I ran that through a skill assessment, and, I, and my, my kind of conclusion on, on Tuesday was, well, we've got, we, we've got a pretty good modeling system running as a, as a free model, so we've got good boundary conditions, good forcing, good river flows. When we look at uh, something like a Taylor diagram, uh, you know, we're, we're falling on this radius equals one for the, for the normalized era, so the model has about the right sort of mesoscale energy, but the correlation is not as low as we would like it to be. So we've got the right size wiggles, but they're not quite in the right place. Uh, similarly, when we look at mooring time series near the entrance to the Gulf of Maine, we've got the very high frequencies accurate because you know, we've got our tides and our, um, uh, and our meteorological forcing are good. The, the low frequencies are good because we've got the seasonal variability. But in this, this mesoscale, we have a gap in coherence. So again, we want to get the wiggles in the right place. So, we have all of these observations that I described, and we have many of them in real time. So let's improve our analysis, and therefore, hopefully, the forecast by data assimilation. So I'm going to describe our real-time data assimilation system, which is still sort of prototype um, today. And so we've, you've already started to see some of this jargon from data assimilation from uh, Jean-Michel. So we're going to have a vector Y of a whole set of observations. Um, <coughs> And X here is my entire model state. H is an operator that interpolates the observations to the same place, uh, that interpolates the model to the same place as the observations. So this difference between model and observations is the innovation. Jean-Michel just introduced that. Uh, 
And then through the magic of data assimilation, you either have a common gain matrix or you have, you, you're doing ensemble, common filter or seek or uh, 3D var or 4D var as I'm going to describe. And that's going to project your innovations back into the model space and the difference, and you're going to make a, an update to have a better analysis. All right, so um, ROMS has a, a number of um, assimilation systems in it, all within the same framework, which is nice. It makes it uh, relatively straightforward to compare them. But most of our development is really being done with this uh, dual spa for, uh, space formulation, possess. I'm not going to get into the details of the different merits of these. Um, there is a, a whole set of papers you can read by Andrew Moore uh, and our group, uh, Andrew Moore at UC Santa Cruz. So um, <clears throat> in, when we're doing reanalyses, our control variables, the things that we are adjusting are the initial conditions at the beginning of that analysis interval, but we also adjust the open boundary conditions and the surface forcing. So there's a number of things that could be in error and we're able to adjust those. And when we're doing reanalyses, we do three days of assimilation, Jean-Michel described seven days in the case of Mercator, and then you go to the next three days and we do it again. Um, but in the operational system, <coughs> we actually redo this every day. So we kind of we recycle observations, and there are reasons that you shouldn't do that, um, strictly speaking, but I'm an engineer, and it kind of works, so we go with it. So uh, we have a three-day analysis interval, and then uh, every day we, uh, so we produce a forecast. We have three days' worth of meteorological forcing uh, at high resolution for the area, and then we move over one day, and we do it all again. So our data window slides along, and, and the previous two days of data would get reused, and then uh, at the end, uh, for uh, sort of retrospective analyses, we take the middle day of each of those three-day analyses and we concatenate them and we stick that on a thread server and we say, on any given day, this is our best estimate of what the ocean looked like. And so that uh, always ends with the latest forecast. So depending on what day you go and access those data, in the, in the last three days you would get slightly different results because we've updated the forecast. I'll say a bit more about that later. Okay, I'm not going to make any apologies for showing the equations. You're all smart people. <coughs> um, so here's, uh, in essence, I'm going to try and explain how 4D VAR works in five minutes with pictures and a few equations. So here we go. Here's, right, a lot of jargon here, so follow along. X, X is the thing we don't know, right? X is our model state. Velocities, temperature, salinity, sea level. Um, as I mentioned, we can interpolate through some operator H. Usually, if it's just if the observations are just an instantaneous observation at a particular point from an XBT or a turtle, then uh, H is just interpolate in four dimensions X, Y, Z, and time to that observation point. So H is just an interpolator. So we interpolate uh, ROMs at any given time, in any given state, to the observation locations. And the difference between those will be the innovation. Uh, this is all of ROMs here, 500,000 lines of Fortran, written as a, a time uh, derivative on the model state, some nonlinear physics, some forcing. And if I put those all on the left-hand side, that all equals zero. All right? So that's the physics of ROMs, all of the turbulence closure schemes and yeah, everything that you could think to, to put in there. So um, the model is not going to exactly fit the observations. So that's represented here. So uh, this is the innovation. And this just, so there's a weighting matrix here, but this is just the innovation with some weights times the innovation. So that's the sum of the squares of all the model data misfits, right? Summing up here over the number of observations. So, so half the, the observation squared. Um, so we're gonna want that to be small. And we also have a term in here for the background. So we've been assimilating data for, you know, years now. We, that memory, of all the previous observations is embodied in the current best estimate of the, the model. So we don't want to throw that out. We want to apply some uh, weighting to that too. So we don't, want, we don't want that difference when we do the uh, incremental update. We don't want to, to go too far from our previous guess because we have some faith in the model that's characterized by this background error covariance. And we have some faith, but not perfect, not absolute faith in the observations. So there's an observation error matrix. So these are just relative weights. And a lot of the art work in 4D var is 
uh, coming up with a, a good specification for those. And Jean-Michel gave a really nice example about how if your observational errors in the, in the, in the posterior afterwards don't seem to agree with your, your prior notion, he's got that alpha factor that they tune to, to bring. So that, that's some kind of shortcoming in your a priori estimate of the uh, observation errors. Okay, so we want to make this model data misfit small. Okay, so you remember your Lagrange multipliers from calculus class? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to define a Lagrange function, which is j here, a function of the model state. That's the thing we want to min minimize. And then we're just going to add another term here. I'm going to take a set of factors, lambda, and multiply them by ROMs. That's always zero, right? Because the model always in numerically equals zero. So I've just added a bunch of zeros. Right? And why would I want to do that? Okay. So this here's the, here's the trick is this Lagrange multiplier. So I'm going to so um, my best best fit simulation will minimize this Lagrange function. So we minimize the Lagrange function by differentiating it with respect to all the things that we might change. All right, some Lagrange function, we differentiate it and we look for a zero for a minimum. Okay. So we're going to differentiate it with respect to these uh, terms lambda, these uh, Lagrange multipliers. These will be the adjoint variables. And we also differentiate it with respect to the model state x. Okay. So, all right, differentiate with respect to lambda. That's pretty easy. J doesn't depend on lambda. It's just a constant in front of this thing here. If I differentiate that with respect to lambda, I just get I back ROMs. So uh, here we're talking about strong constraint assimilation. So once we've uh, got our increments and we run the model, the model runs through that three-day analysis interval without any uh, changes to anything. And so the model physics are exactly satisfied during that analysis interval. There's going to be a little jump at the end when we go to the next cycle, but during that interval, it's conserving all the equations that are in ROMs. Differentiating with respect to um, x, it's a bit more tricky. So I'm going to differentiate this with respect to x. Well, there's this term here uh, that looks like x squared, right? It's, h, it's a half hx squared. So you differentiate a half x squared, you get a half of 2x, you just get back x. Right? That's why we put the half in there. So what we get back is, is h uh, x uh, minus y. We get the innovation. So we end up with a term here that looks like the innovation with some scaling factors because of the observational error on the right-hand side of this adjoint ROMs equation. Uh, when we differentiate this part here with respect to x, that's a little bit more tricky. But look at this part. So I've got lambda here times n of x with a negative sign. Well, this is all of nonlinear ROMs. So if I differentiate that with respect to x, I get uh, the lambda dx times n, but lambda doesn't depend on x, so that's 0, plus lambda times dn dx. Imagine taking all the code in ROMs that depends on the state, wherever there's a u and a v, and you differentiate that through. So you get a term that looks like this, a dn dx times lambda. And the, the time derivative, that's a bit, you know, that involves an integration by parts and a whole lot of other variational calculus we won't go through. But it ends up with this negative sign, and we get an equation that looks like this. It kind of looks like ROMs. It's got all the same parts in it. It's got Coriolis. It's got mixing, all those things. But it's uh, in terms of these adjoint variables, and there's a negative sign here, and we integrate it backwards in time. And other parts of that minimation, minimization will lead to some other conclusions. We, we see that at the end of the forecast interval, lambda t is always 0. So the adjoint model, which starts at the end of the analysis interval and comes backward in time, is always initialized with 0. And when you get to the end of the adjoint solution at time 0, I'm going backwards in time, it's going to give us some information about how these adjoint variables are connected to the, the sensitivity of that cost function j to the thing that we're trying to minimize. Right. Right. I hope you followed that. That was all of 40 var. All right. So here's what happens. We got, um, so we got our uh, um, previous forecast background. You've already seen this once from Jean-Michel. That satisfies ROMs. All right. Then uh, <coughs> we get some observations come in. They don't, they don't match. So there is some model data misfit. This is the innovation. OK, so those are the innovations. And remember I said that those innovations appear as a set of delta functions on the right-hand side to the adjoint equation. So let's just look at those uh, delta functions, put them down here. And so this is my, uh, my forcing that's on the right-hand side of the adjoint 
equation. The adjoint down here is always, is, starts at the end of the interval, and it integrates backwards in time, and it's forced by those delta functions. So every time it hits an observation, it gets a little nudge in some direction, and then we get back to the zero point here, and this gives us some information on the sensitivity of J to perturbations in the, the model state. So we use that in a conjugate gradient search algorithm to say, well, let's change X in some certain direction, and we'll redo this, and we'll get uh, another value of um, the misfits that will be smaller. And there's an iteration in this because we're searching in a very large multidimensional space. The space we're dealing with is, in three days, we typically have 200,000 observations in that, in that region I showed you. But the model state X is, there's, there's a million grid points in the model, there's at least four 3D state variables, that's four million. We're doing this in time, there's 720 time steps um, in that three-day interval. So X is about um, 9 billion uh, elements. So it never exists as a vector like this. It's just a model that we're integrating. Okay. So then we get our, uh, our new solution. We make an increment to the prior estimate. We run it again. It gets a lot closer to the observations. As I said, there's an iteration in here. And eventually we converge, and we've got our best estimate of the, the model trajectory. <coughs> so uh, so we've, we've taken the uh, innovations, through the 4D var machinery, we've effectively uh, turned them into an increment that gets added to XB, and that's my new analysis. And the analysis, as a function of time, is a consequence of running, I'm trying to reverse time for you, for you so, um, a consequence of the, the strong constraint uh, running the nonlinear model over that analysis interval once we've converged. Okay. Um, <coughs> so the, the, this best fit now will become the initial conditions for the forecast. So we run that forecast, then we step forward a day or three days. Uh, we do it again, we get some new observations, we redo the fit, and then we have a new analysis. OK. So uh, for those of you that are looking into this, if you want to uh, start working with the ROMs assimilation machinery, I'll just run through this. So, um, and I've glossed over some details. We're doing all this in the incremental space. We're looking at We've got a nonlinear trajectory, and we look at how um, perturbations would evolve. So it's like taking a Taylor series expansion to the nonlinear model. How would a small, that's, so we get a tangent linear approximation to, to the ROM solution. And the adjoint is an adjoint of that tangent linear model because we want to work with, with linear um, <coughs> models in this because then if we well condition the minimization problem, it will have very nice convergence properties when we do our conjugate gradient solution. Okay, and so this um, adjoint ROMs, as I said, integrated backward in time, um, informs this gradient descent algorithm that lets us minimize the model data misfits, and they're weighted by their respective observation errors. So upon convergence, that final nonlinear ROMs trajectory, so at the, at, at the end, we stop and we run the nonlinear model one more time to get through that analysis window. So it acknowledges all of the observations within the analysis interval, and their expected errors. It imposes the exact solution of the model dynamic equations during that final analysis. And because of that background error, it retains a history of all of the previous observations. <coughs> right. Um, so that's all the jargon. I think we've covered this a few times. We've got the background state, innovation, um, and it's connected through here, this, this common gain, to give us our analysis. Okay. Um, all right, so some of the practicalities. So what are we using when we do this? Um, the same forcing and boundary conditions that I described for the standalone forward nonlinear model. And then we, uh, we scoop up all the observations we can find in our, in our area. So we've got uh, surface currents from a regional HF radar network. Those are available to us after about uh, four hours of delay by the time all of the uh, data is transmitted from the 13 or 14 Shore stations, radar stations, they get uh, processed, quality controlled, run through an algorithm that combines them into vector velocities, and then we have those. Um, IUS regional associations operate various um, uh, slocum gliders or, or others in the area, and so uh, there's a glider data assembly center, a glider DAC run by uh, IUS. It's usually about one hour be between a, a surfacing of a glider and transmitting that data and adding it to the, to the DAC. And that's all available through a Threads data server. 
for those of you that are familiar with threads. Um, there's six or eight AVHRR SST passes in the domain per day, so we get those from our own um, regional association, Maracus, from a, a HRPT receiving station at the University of Delaware, so we simulate those. We go out and we get the three hourly, uh, so GOES is a geostationary satellite, we get the three hourly infrared data, we get microwave SST from Winsat and AMSR from various places, from, um, from a NOAA ERDAP server and from the NASA PODAC uh, data assembly, um, data distributed active archive center. Um, so we have a set of scripts that are going around harvesting all these data. We used to use um, blended SST products, but we've gone away from that because this is 4D VAR, and you know, we have a diurnal cycle in the sea surface temperature, and when you take one of those blended products, it's kind of an average over a day, and, and you, you don't necessarily know what went into that average. You know, we always joke about, you know, the, the sausage. It's like, it may be a really excellent Spanish chorizo sausage, or it could be some nasty British sausage thing, right? So we don't do that. We let ROMS 4D VAR do that merger. So we, we're keeping the individual satellites. And there's another reason to do that that I'll hopefully get to when I talk about observation impact. Um, if, it's a, if there's an altimeter satellite on orbit, we use it. Uh, and we, we pull our data from the Radar Altimeter Database System, RADS. Um, anything that is transmitted to the global telecommunications system, so the weather system, so XPTs on ships of opportunity, or CTDs, Argo floats, uh, surface drifters. Um, uh, we don't have any elephant seals in our area, but elephant seal temperature and uh, salinity data in, in the Pacific is transmitted to the GTS. And it's all accessible. Um, we've got some moorings and, and things. All right, so we've tried to get all of the data that we possibly can. So this runs every night. <coughs> We have a, a whole set of uh, scripts running in cron jobs, and I will admit this is, this is a, uh, it's a complete nightmare. There's probably four or five of us all running different cron jobs on different machines. Mine's all in, in MATLAB or NCO tools. Uh, Eli likes Python. Uh, Alex is using Perl. They're a mess. <laughs> I would never share them with anyone. But we kind of built this thing you know, to see what would happen. And so we, get the, we have to get the uh, uh, boundary condition data from uh, Mercator. We need the river um, data. We need the meteorological forcing from NAM or, or GFS as a backup. Uh, we gather all the satellites, the altimetry, do our processing. Eventually, we get all that. We combine them all into a single file that is the ROMS observation file with a certain format. We do the 4D VAR analysis. It runs on, on 12 cores of an old cluster. It takes a couple of hours. And then we run the forecast. All of our output goes to our thread server, and then we have a little check to see what we did and didn't get. You know, there was no, I just got an email, there was no Altica SSH data last night. So now I have to figure out well, what happened. So, okay, we do all that. So what do we have? We've got uh, surface currents from CODAR. We might typically get, you know, three or four passes of uh, three altimeters within a three-day interval. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over making some uh, remarks about coastal altimetry, um, just to say that uh, this is really good stuff in the coastal zone. You should not, if you're a coastal oceanographer, reject the use of altimeter data because someone said to you, oh, you can't use altimetry in the coastal ocean. Rubbish. You can, uh, and you should. <laughs> um, and there's a whole set of technological reasons uh, why you should. One word of caution is uh, if your model of the coastal ocean has high frequency variability, like tides, which it should, then you shouldn't make a tide correction to the altimeter data because that's now part of your signal. It's not something you're trying to remove. Similarly, if you are driving your coastal model with uh, atmospheric pressure variability and getting that dynamic response, then you should not make the dynamic atmosphere correction because it's not really a correction. It's removing uh, actual physics from the altimeter data. So you just need to be careful about making uh, things consistent between your model physics and your data. Uh, working with altimetry. And that's a general lesson, I guess. Um, so, uh, we, uh, so, we put, so we monitor the system. I want to say a little bit about monitoring. So we use this uh, ERDAP. People, ERDAP is awesome. Um, this is an ERDAP slide sort of page where I plot all of the wind. So this is the wind forcing, radiation, uh, et cetera, from, uh, that are in our forcing files. And I can, I can refresh this page every day by hitting the Submit button. And if I see something that says no data, that tells me something failed in the input data stream. Or if there's you know, something exciting, like a cyclone coming through, I'll, I'll see that, and I'll be able to, to browse through this. Um, 
So um, I was going to show you this, but I'm going to skip over that one. And if I scroll down on this page, we would also see the river discharge from the geological survey and all of the uh, observational data streams. So I can make sure that everything's there and looks OK. Um, sometimes we see strange things in the river data if one of the river gauges freezes, for example. It'll say, you know, ice. So we, we've lost discharge data in that case. Um, and we can monitor um, all of the, the observations. So um, <coughs> as an example, um, if I t go over to my uh, temperature page, these are all the temperature observations. I can, um, uh, I, 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 if I click on that data, uh, data button, it will open up this page. And you can see I've got a plot over here of latitude, longitude. Um, I've got a particular time range. And that's everything. So those are all the, the, the different satellite uh, uh, products all merged together. And I've put a constraint in here, just show me depths greater than negative two. So uh, negative two. So it's just the top two meters. So that way, I, this plot doesn't include all of the Argo floats and everything else at subsurface. I can just look at those. And then I can say, well, you know, um, well, that's interesting. It looks a bit, you know, looks a bit odd. There's some funny things in there. So I, we keep a provenance code in the observation file. So I can say, just show me ones that are provenance 302. And then that is AVHRR. So like, ah, OK, so it was a bit cloudy out there that day. Um, I can look at provenance code 303. Uh, so this is AVHRR. I could look at provenance code 303. That would just be the geostationary uh, SST. And you get more of that because the clouds blow through. And you get you know, a look at the ocean during the course of the day, or three days. Um, we can look at. Um, Microwave, uh, Windsat, microwave, which is a bit patchy. I don't know why the microwave um, is patchy from WSAT, so that's a worry. And, uh, and this is uh, AMSA 2. So I can see these different products. And um, we're going to use this information later. We're keeping track of where all these data come from. It will allow us, if, if one of these observations was having an undue impact on the analysis, we might want to go back and figure out where it was from. And so this way, we keep, you know, we keep the evidence, the, the, the evidence train of to where all this stuff is going from. Another reason not to use um, blended products, I think. And we do the same thing for altimetry. So these are all the altimetry data in a, in a three-day window. And, I, and we've got different provenance codes for them. And you can see there are three. And for those of you that know your altimeter ground tracks, you'll know that the purple is Jason. The red here is, uh, this is Altica. And the orange is Cryosat. So that's the sort of data we would get in the course of a day, uh, three days, sorry. Um, going through them all, like that. <coughs> so all right, so I've put all the data in. I've run my uh, 4D via analysis. I've produced the forecast. As I said, we, we um, concatenate these with the middle days. And we present a, a, a real-time, best uh, uh, available forecast on our thread server. We use this uh, forecast model run collection. Uh, which is a really nice feature from Unidata. All of the, all of the files are there, so every three-day analysis and three-day forecast, so a six-day file, is kept on our system. And we configure this server to do that concatenation of the analyses and the final forecast. But you can go into uh, any one of the actual history runs, and you can look at a, a given forecast, what it was back at that day. If you wanted to see, oh, well, how good was my forecast of you know, hurricane this or, or hurricane that, all that information is retained. We haven't deleted any of those, those outputs. And you can actually create another collection of these that rather than being the middle day of the analysis, you could just string together all of the uh, forecasts from day uh, three to day five. And then you've got a time series that is uh, continuously through your entire data window of all of the three-day forecasts. So you just run that against your data set, and you get the mean squared error of your three-day forecasts. And we have another collection two-day. You get the mean squared error of your two-day forecasts. So it's very easy to monitor the, the loss and predictor skill of the model. You're not manipulating all different files. You just have a single URL to a single um, data, uh, data URL in this. OK. So how well do we do? And just some, these are some old plots that I'm afraid some of you may have seen before. But there's kind of two ways to do your verification. You can look at the model skill uh, against withheld data, data that never went into the assimilation system. And that's an example of that. So this is the correlation against altimetry. When we have no assimilation, these are the JSON ground tracks. Um, 
The correlation increases in the coastal region once we assimilate the data. Of course it should. We assimilated it, right? We've got the wiggles in the same place now. Um, and here's the correlation from Envyset. These data were never assimilated, but we can see quite high correlations through the continental shelf region at points that fall between the ground tracks of the JSON uh, altimeter. So our model is, is, uh, has good skill at predicting sea level variability between where our repeated observations from JSON are falling. So that's, that's good news. Um, or you can do it with respect to, um, this is here taking an ensemble of, of uh, in situ observations down to about 400 meters. So these are mostly XPTs off the shelf, but also on the shallow water. And we can look at, um, and I talked about bias, correcting biases in the model. So if you don't correct the bias, you get a correlation like this. Um, if, you, if you do correct the biases in the boundary conditions, well, we get better correlations and lower biases, not surprisingly. And then we can see, OK, then we do the analysis much better, right? Now we've got the wiggles in the right places. And now we go into forecast mode. And well, how long do we retain this predictive skill? Well, after two days, we're starting to lose some skill against the observations that are not yet assimilated. That's expected. Um, four days, we're starting to get down to the correlations we had of the free running model. So you could say, well, the useful skill that's been added through the data assimilation uh, step persists for maybe three days into the future. All right. um, <coughs> and, and we monitor this assimilation performance with another ERDAP interface. And I'm just going to give you an example of this. So I showed you those plots of all of the observations, right? Well, I can find that, and those, that was uh, latitude versus longitude, and the color was the observation value. Well, I can go in here, and I've got the observation value. But once we've run the assimilation, we've also got the model values at the observation locations because we ran that uh, interpolation operator, h times x, to the observation locations. So I can, just, I can just plot that observation against model. I've immediately got a scatter plot of my model skill. I'm just going to do a quick switch here. And that work? OK. So that's that browser. Those were those, uh, the observations. I talked about provenance codes. So now we end up in here. OK. So um, I said to Eli Hunter, who's my technician that, that does all of this, who's, uh, who runs the scripts that create the open boundary conditions from HICOM and from Mercator. We keep both of them. And I said, well, could you just, can you just run your uh, interpolation over that at the same locations as the data. So we have what Mercator would have said the uh, analysis would be at our observation points. And so, oh yeah, he does that. And he uses uh, uh, NCKS to just add that to the net CDF file. And so you go in here and you say, oh, well, let's plot uh, not uh, the ROMS model value, but let's plot uh, Mercator. And then you go down here, you hit redraw the graph. And luckily, all right. So Mercator is pretty good, right? The spread here is larger. There's a few uh, points that are not quite as good. It's like, oh, OK. Eric's not here, so I can show HICOM. Um, all right. A lot more spread, all right? But with each of these points here, I, could, I can tunnel in with different constraints. I can figure out where it is. I can figure out what its provenance code is. And I can see, well, you know, why are these points not uh, analyzed as well um, by HICOM? as they are by our ROM system. All that information is there in this for us to, to play around. You can go, um, let's see, we go here. If I click on this data access form in this view, I get a table that's like this. Okay, It looks the same. It's got all the same constraints. But there's a thing that, can you read that? Um, this output, HCM, go in here. These are all the ways you can get this data downloaded. You can have a MATLAB file, you can have a JSON file, you can get a GeoTIFF, you can have NetCDF. And that is um, available to you as here. Just generate the URL. You can cut and paste that into your Python script, and it will immediately go to this page, download those data, and they'll be available for you to do some some higher order statistics. You can create your Taylor diagrams or whatever, and you can t monitor and analyze this system in, in real time. This file updates every day when the um, analysis runs. OK. It's a little pitch for ERDAP. I think it's a, it's a marvelous tool that you can do different things with. So there's that. Okay. 
Um, and you can just uh, click back. You can go back seven days, seven days, seven days, or whatever time you want, time constraints, um, all kinds of different formats. OK. <clears throat> so data assimilation uh, improves our estimate of the ocean state. And I would say more data is always better. Uh, diversity is good. Diverse data is better. Get observations, get things from turtles and lobsters, you know, uh, salinity, velocity, uh, the variety. But we're going to ask, well, but, you know, this stuff is expensive to acquire. Um, or some of it breaks, and, you know, maybe we should fix it sooner or later. So we could ask the question, are some data more helpful than others? And uh, so back to this equation, right? So, yeah, so we've got this uh, observation impact driver inside ROMS 4D VAR. <clears throat> so we've got this, right? And if you know a lot about uh, the common gain, there's all kinds of things you can do with this. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, we want to look at, we're going to create some particular metric, a single number for each analysis interval, and we're going to ask the question, how does that particular number respond to the observations that went into the assimilation? So you pick something that's kind of relevant for one of, for one of your um, uh, end users or, you know, some particular societal objective or some scientific objective. But it's going to be a number, uh, i, that's a function of the model state. So it could be the, and this is the example we're going to use, it could be uh, integrating along a particular track here. This is in the middle of that Pioneer array. What's the cross-shelf heat flux uh, on a three-day average through that line? So it's one number, right? And so I could calculate whatever that... that metric is on the basis of my um, first guess, my background, and I can compute it again on the basis of the analysis. And those two things will be different because in the course of doing the assimilation, I've changed uh, the ROM state and I've got a different number. So this delta in that metric is the impact from assimilating observations with respect to this particular metric. Okay. So Many different ways to formulate that metric, but you pick something that matters for you and say, okay, what happened? All right, so the analysis here is the background plus the increment. So that's just XB plus uh, KD, and if I subtract off XB, if I expand this, all right, we're making small increments, so you can make a Taylor series expansion. So, um, so a Taylor series expansion of I of X plus uh, delta is I of X plus DI DX times delta. Right, so here's the delta, is this, D transposed, and because we've got add joints in here, it gets transposed, and D I D X. And the I of XB, the background, gets subtracted off. So this is the change. And this is, um, <coughs> this is a vector of all of the innovations. This is D. Right? And I is a scalar. So this thing here must also be a vector. We're going from the uh, model space through the common gain back into the observation space. So it's a vector that's the length of the number of observations, about 200,000 in an analysis. And so if you think of it this as the as summation of uh, each element of D times some weighting factor G, and there's one of those for each observation. So each element of G, this thing here, is uniquely associated with each one of those observations. And each is a little piece of that, that delta i, and you add them up together and you get the whole change. So some observations may have a large impact if G i is, the magnitude of G i is big, um, or a small impact. So what we're going to do is we're going to group um, observations by type to see what's the impact of temperature, or what's the ob impact of uh, altimetry on one of these metrics. But we can also break it out into what was the impact of AVHRR temperature, what was the impact of Argo temperature for example, and C. <laughs> All right, so we do that. <coughs> um, what have I got, like five minutes? Yeah. All right, I'm trying to get us some, some coffee. Um, so, uh, all right, so if you've got right under the, under the hood, under the bonnet in um, data assimilation, you'll know that classically the karma gain is, is defined by this. And it, it never exists as a matrix, I said. Um, we, 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 we do this by running this adjoint and tangent linear or, you know, in, in ensemble methods, it's a different approach. But, but we're all um, solving this matrix problem. So we've got the, the tangent linear um, uh, operator, we've got an observation error covariance, we've got all of these things. So that doesn't exist in, in, in actual space. <coughs> but um, we can make an approximation to this that we call kappa, uh, K tilde, the practical gain matrix, because in every iteration of the 4D VAR, 
we get these uh, Langchos vectors that uh, are what we're using to find our search directions uh, in the minimization problem. And uh, we can create a matrix out of those, um, and it's going to be a reasonable approximation. It's going to allow us to, to calculate a reasonable approximation to this. Um, there's some other linear algebra in here. There's a very nasty matrix here that you'll notice has to be inverted, which is never good, but it's actually a tridiagonal matrix. So if you have to invert a matrix, tridiagonal is the one you want to do. All right. So we can do this. And, and, and the way it works in practice is we're, we're going to solve uh, an adjoint uh, problem that has some forcing that looks like this, this sensitivity that depends on the model state. And that's just something we calculate in a MATLAB script because it doesn't depend on the value of the state. It's just it's, it's uh, coefficients that are sensitivity. And we, with a single integration of the tangent linear model and the fact that we are able in ROMS 40 var to save all these Lanchos vectors that allow us to construct this approximation, the practical gain matrix, we can get to these, these observation impact values. All right, so that's what we do. So here are the two metrics I'm going to describe. Uh, volume transport through this line where the OOI uh, array is, or the heat flux. So your metric doesn't have to be linear. It just has to be differentiable with respect to the model state. <coughs> and uh, if you do that, and this is very busy, so here's a time series. These are the observation impacts in terms of all of the, they're grouped by uh, color over there for different uh, observation type. Let's just zoom in on one of these. So here, this is different three-day analysis intervals, and this is delta i in sphere drips. So how much did the volume flux across that line change in the process of assimilating those observations? And generally, there's there's good consensus among the observations. So sea surface temperature, sea surface height, uh, the subsurface temperatures, they were all saying at this particular time that we should increase the transport. So the, the model state was adjusted in going from the background through the increment to the analysis to increase that transport in order to bring everything into better agreement with the observations. And then you know, three days later, they would change their mind and they say, no, 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 that was too fast, slow it down. But you can, but you can see by the relative magnitude of these what's having an impact. Um, <clears throat> and you can also see that you know, time periods come in where there's a lot of influence from the subsurface temperature and salinity in the green and yellow. And I go to that date in my observation browser in, in ERDAP, and I can see, oh, yeah, the, look, there's a whole lot of Pioneer gliders just got deployed. Um, here, this is the Oleander container vessel with the ADCP on board and dropping XPTs on its way to Bermuda. Um, you know, they're doing a pretty good job of flying their, their lines here. So you can, you can just browse through this and, and see what's going on. Um, we can look at the RMS impact in terms of the heat flux from uh, assimilating the radar observations. And this is just a mean over uh, two years, 1415. So on average, we can see, not surprisingly, that observations near, the, the colors up here, near our transect have the greatest impact. But there's also a trail that comes all the way down here, right? So observations all the way along the shelf break front in the Mid-Atlantic Bite, observations of velocity at the surface, are having a significant impact on. So this is telling us something about the, the teleconnections in that shelf slope front that are being communicated by the adjoint model that propagates information, uh, I know, the, the tangent linear that's propagating information downstream. We can look at uh, all the in situ hydrographic data. Not surprisingly, observations right around our, uh, our um, metric uh, zone line are having uh, the most, but you can also see um, uh, observations up here are making a difference. So uh, this is probably saying that uh, corrections to the boundary conditions are still important and they're always making, uh, having an effect that's felt through the domain. Um, generally speaking, values on the shelf are not as important, um, uh, have, have less impact than on the uh, slope. And uh, same thing for altimetry. Okay, uh, Altimetry is an interesting story. So if we look at the innovation versus the impact, well, if the, if the innovation was really small, the model nailed it first time around, right? So there's not going to be much um, uh, increment. Uh, so we, we sort of have a little zero point in here. And generally, as the innovation gets larger, the model has had to make a greater adjustment. So usually, as the innovation increases, the uh, impact increases. But you just see there's a couple of points that are kind of wacky. They're way out there. They've got huge impacts for a moderate uh, innovation. And when we did this, we went back and we looked. Um, it was really only five passes of cryosat that we can pick out that had a very disproportionate impact. So there's something wrong 
either with our QC, because we've let uh, um, some observation through that has a huge impact, um, a disproportionate impact, or um, we've got maybe a problem in the mean sea surface that I think is, that I think that's actually what the problem is for Cryosat because it's poorly known between the adjacent ground tracks. Uh, but it allows us to go back and, and look at this. So we're now closing the cycle. We're not just ocean modelers and data assimilators that are pulling in all this data and doing something with it. We are now generating actionable information that we can go back to the observing networks and say, hey, you've got a, we've got a problem here that you, we need to fix so that we can, uh, so that everyone can, can use these data effectively. Okay, so that was a bit of a sprint. Um, so uh, just to recap, uh, so we have this 4 var system uh, running for Maracuse. It uses all available data. Uh, honestly, I, 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 I hunt down new sources of data whenever I hear about something. Um, uh, you know, we're gonna have those um, fishing trawler uh, subsurface temperatures in the real-time system within within six months because we've we've got NOAA to to agree and the fishermen to to agree that that would be a, a valuable thing. Um, I said more and diverse uh, data is better. I've skipped over a whole lot of the pre-processing in QC, but that's in the the chapter that I'm I'm writing. Bias removal is important, and I've I've kind of shown you we make a lot of use of these uh, web services, OpenDAP and Threads, um, ERDAP, um, NetCDF and HDF, following conventions. If people are serving their data following these conventions, it's trivially easy for us to write another script, put another cron job in, and pull in some more data at night. So I really encourage you to, to, um, to you know, advocate for open data, uh, a, a common format, uh, community standards for serving your, uh, your data. And you should do that for your model output also so that everybody else can look at it. Um, I didn't talk much about skill. Four days for temperature, one or two days for velocity. We use these uh, forecast model run collections for our output. And then the observation impact analysis is what we're working towards. Um, it lets us uh, monitor uh, uh, various elements for quality control. Um, and in the future, we, we could uh, use it this to, 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 to better direct movable assets like, like gliders. And, and just a few comments on a development path for ROMs at the moment. Uh, we're working on uh, using the two-way nesting in forecasts, so we're going to try that in our Maracuse system, just using a nested model in the background, but not in the assimilation. Um, uh, Andrew Moore and Hernan Arango are working on a hybrid ensemble uh, carbon filter 40 var using the DART machinery. That's well advanced. That's an O&R project. Uh, we're doing two-way nested 40 var by having the nesting inside the adjoint and tangent linear all through uh, for the Pioneer array. Um, Maciek asked about um, uh, optical data. We have some experience writing an adjoint of uh, an MPZD class ecosystem model. Uh, I think a better way to go would be to actually uh, assimilate inherent optical properties, uh, if you remember that from uh, talks this uh, last week. Um, uh, we've written that code, we haven't worked with it. And there's a lot of coupling work we're doing using this ESMF new OPSI layer. We've got coupled ROMs to the Los Alamos sea ice model, coupled it to the Navy's COAMPS atmospheric model, coupled it to um, SWAN, and we're working on Wave Watch 3. And we actually figured out we could use the coupling to put one model, like a high resolution storm surge model for Chesapeake Bay, and, and, and do the coupling to a shelf model like ROMs. Uh, all right, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. So time for questions. We are a bit late, but uh, that's OK. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much yep. for your talk. Uh, I have four questions, if it is possible. I promise I'm, I'm going to be very, cool, very quick. All of them are regarding the assimilation of surface currents from HF radars oh, okay. into rooms. <laughs> Um, I'd like to know the reasons why you are simulating totals instead of radials. Because uh, it's easier. <laughs> um, but <laughs> we have another project that's not here. We, um, uh, colleagues, um, Brian Powell at the University of Hawaii has been assimilating radials. It, what it needs is a change to that observation operator H and its tangent linear and adjoint. Uh, but we know how to do that. Um, we, so we have a project working with NOAA where we're going to assimilate radials, uh, which has an advantage that if you're on a, co a concave coastline and all your radars look out to sea, you don't get much overlap, so you get a, a low number of totals. So that's one reason to do it. And the other reason is it's gone into this, 
this combined uh, velocity. So we don't know which one of those sites was really, uh, if, if we had a large impact for CODA, I don't know which one of those radar sites is important. But we can do the observation impact and accumulate those, those Gs, right, for individual radar sites. And, we, and w the way we pitched this in the proposal, uh, after Hurricane Sandy, we lost uh, uh, seven or eight of our radar sites. They were all washed away, right? So there's this big gap in the radar network. Well, which one of those uh, radars was really important? So if we have done this analysis over two years, we can say these radar sites are absolutely critical for shipping operations in and out of the port of New York. If one of them goes down, we should fix that one first. So that's a, that was a long answer, sorry, but there's a lot of uh, yeah, layers to that. And the other question is, um, have you studied the need of localization in order to avoid the impact of assimilating HF radar surface currents over the HF radar footprint and the impact on other part of the models um, of the model no, domain? So localization is, is a common practice in um, ensemble methods mm -hmm. where, so for everybody, uh, you can imagine just saying, uh, if, you're, if your increments have large values a long way from the observation location. That seems Im implausible. And so you might just you sort of set those out. I've asked Andy, I'm not the expert here, right? I've asked uh, Andrew Moore about it, and he's, you know, we, no, we don't do that in 4 var It's like, well, okay, but you know, we do have some <laughs> large increments in places. So that's a very good question, and I, I don't have an answer for you, but we could take that up with, with, with Andy. And have you studied the impact on the subsurface correction? Um, so, uh, no, specifically not. So, and to do that, you would just need to formulate another functional I. Okay. If you want to say, all right, I want to know how, how much, um, you know, and you might think of, uh, say, two-layer exchange in an upwelling region, so how much am I affecting the onshore flow that's subsurface? You just need to, to write, just need to write that I function, figure out how to differentiate it uh, with respect to X, and write the code. So it's... Um, yeah, whatever the metric is that you think is important, we can, we can build the system for it. And because we've saved all those land shots vectors, when we did the analysis the first time, and it was really expensive, we can always just go back and do the one run of the adjoint to get the sensitivity. So. And the last question, uh, have you studied uh, the improvement on, on the sea level, on the shelf area, just because of the simulating the chief radar surface currents? I haven't looked specifically at sea level. We did look at Lagrangian trajectories by making some comparisons to uh, model drifters versus US Coast Guard um, SLDMB drifters, the ones they throw out for search and rescue operations. And I have to say that the improvement was quite modest. Uh, it was disappointing. But I think um, we need to look more closely at our uh, error models. And uh, I think we're not getting the full value of those uh, HF radar data yet. So. It remains to be seen. Yeah. Yeah, Virginia. Hi. Um, so you just your previous slide, you mentioned about, like, okay, more data is always better. In terms of physical oceanography, I feel like you have, guys, so much data already. And if you had to do some model using, um, so for biogeochemical modeling, similar to ROMs, but including biogeochemical data in the future, how much data did you, would you need then? As much as you can get me. <laughs> <laughs> I would never say stop. <coughs> okay, I might say stop with the satellite SST. That's kind of over the top at the moment. But uh, that would... Now, the, the question, the, the more important question would be, mm. Well, if I only could, if I can only afford to put out X number of floats, or I could only afford to put an oxygen sensor on them, um, or a nitrate sensor, I'm making this up, an oxygen sensor or a nitrate sensor, but not both, uh, which would be the most valuable for me? And uh, I don't know that answer, but I have the whole machinery here where I could do that experiment, and that would be a really fun thing to do. Yeah, we could do that in a, in a methodical, quantitative way. Okay, thank you. I think we have to go to coffee break now for 25 minutes, so we will convene at 11.30.